Next we have Bob Sin and John Pronto, both principals in Chicago's office of Thornton Tomasetti. Bob and John are members of the ACI Committee 363 on High Strength Concrete and have significant experience in designing structures for many tall buildings, both in the United States and internationally. The title of their presentation is Recent Super Tall Concrete Towers in the Middle East. Please welcome my best friends. Well, thank you, Larry, for the introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here, uh, both for myself uh, and to also be presenting with my colleague, Bob Sin. Um, so, yeah, today we're really going to tell the tale of two different projects, uh, which are actually quite significantly different structurally. Um, uh, one project, of course, which you'll be very familiar with, uh, I'm sure, uh, with Bobson on Jetta Tower. And I'm going to talk a little bit about an ongoing project right now that's got multiple phases called Uptown Dubai uh, in downtown uh, Dubai. Uh, uh, this is the Uptown Dubai project. Um, it's a little bit of a different building topology than what you might have seen like with Burj Khalifa and Jetta Tower. It's predominantly a commercial office structure. Um, so one might think about how that might play into how we structure the building. Um, and these are really going to be the challenges uh, of the project that we wanted to identify and just kind of introduce you to and have a dialogue maybe at the end of the presentation on if we have some time. You know, of course, uh, designing a building that's super tall, but also designing an office tower that's 711 meters is quite significant. Um, there's the material challenges and procurement and quality control of delivering high strength concrete uh, on this scale, uh, as well as you'll see the larger isolated elements that'll have to deal with mass concreting. Um, as well as then local challenges, uh, as far as how you deal with uh, authorities and regulations are always an uh, interesting um, and challenging part of the process that uh, might not be as much engineering, but more uh, uh, discussion and communication. Um, and then, of course, there's always unique challenges, and this one uh, has, has got a few of them that I think would be quite interesting to talk about from a wind engineering standpoint. So. Um, with that, uh, the, really the project in itself, as I mentioned, is predominantly commercial. Um, so we knew from the onset when we structured the system that you're not going to be able to get away with solid bearing wall systems or, or any kind of shear wall engaged systems that demise the entire office floor plate, uh, breaking up any kind of open lease spans uh, that, that a project of this magnitude would demand for anchor tenants. Um, so it's, it's a core and outrigger system, and it's really pushed to the extreme. Um, they, they are efficient systems, but they are also very challenged systems, as it's not a distributed system. Uh, you're concentrating all of your engagement at isolated locations, um, which you can see here at these points uh, in the tower at the outriggers. So a lot of work was done, um, particularly on getting data uh, for modulus and for um, high strength concrete. We didn't really uh, have the luxury of having this data during the design, but we knew what was achievable and we're finally now, a couple of years later, with um, construction ongoing, getting the data that we hope to see um, for the actual project where we're starting to achieve uh, modulus of elasticity. Actually at 56 days, uh, we only specified it at 90, uh, well in exceedance of what we had specified, which was 43 GPA. Um, we're getting it actually closer to 50 uh, GPA on a regular basis for average. Um, as well as high strength concretes, we are specifying 100 MPA cylinder at 90 days. Um, and that's uh, actually being uh, uh, another topic for this phase because the aggregates are so good, we are actually not needing to do what we do in the U.S. where the modulus starts to control over the strength. We actually are going to have to have that dialogue as we move forward because an 80 MPA mix to a 90 MPA mix uh, in Dubai is actually achieving the modulus targets that we need or exceeding them. In the U.S. we see the flip uh, typically in what we're actually seeing. So. Um, this is the floor plate. You can see very large discrete elements um, in, around the perimeter. At the base, they do get quite substantial, uh, on the order of three to four meters at the base, uh, squares. Um, so you can imagine the heat of hydration challenges with that, um, as well as um, just the overall formwork complexity uh, from a placement uh, standpoint uh, has its own challenges. Uh, we've also studied steel composite systems. Um, this is one interesting topic because you don't see it much in the Middle East. 
um, but it's a project of such a scale that bringing a new technology was uh, something that everyone was willing to entertain, at least as an alternate, um, so that we could try to find ways to optimize the schedule uh, on the project. Um, however, it did have some impacts on the aerodynamics that uh, we'll talk about. And then predominantly, as the office or floor plate starts to degrade and starts to, the lease span starts to drop to something more traditional, like a 9 meters lease span, um, we really, due to the amount of vertical transportation in the building, we have a pretty substantial ability to use flat plate construction. Um, so that is the, I would say, the predominant uh, structural system that we have, except for at the base. Um, and, and really, this is just kind of give you a little sense of some of the scale of the sizes. As I mentioned, anywhere from 2 meters to 4 meters um, of typical mega column sizes, mostly due uh, to the actual lateral system stiffness requirements and not so much uh, the overturning resistance. Um, this is, of course, the obligatory uh, analysis models, uh, images, snapshots that you have to put up as a structural engineer. These are just two different systems across the top where we studied um, alternate iterations of whether or not we're going to actually use steel trussing uh, for outriggers. There's a lot of benefit from a mechanical and coordination standpoint to that. There's a lot of formwork challenges with respect to that for embedding steel elements of this scale into the actual formwork system. Um, and then, of course, uh, more traditional concrete systems, which actually are quite substantially stiff, but um, don't have as much logistical flexibility of when you actually build them. Um, this is just a, just a little isometric of the overall system. So the, the approach on this says seismic uh, is not as high as what you might see in uh, the west coast of the U.S. or in some areas in China. But uh, in, in Dubai, there is, a, a, I would say, a substantial concern for the actual seismic mapping of the region. Um, the fact is it hasn't really had a very robust mapping done in a while. It's, it's undergoing a, a remapping currently uh, as we speak with the DM. Um, so, it, you know, right now we're actually designing buildings still to UBC 97 uh, in, in Dubai. And based on that, you know, we're using basic uh, overstrength factors and amplifications to keep things elastic, let's say, or ductile uh, in these larger, um, larger seismic events. Um, this is an overview of the, the outriggers. So as you can tell, uh, it does get quite congested in these mechanical zones. Our mechanical contractors like to say that these are not mechanical floors, they're structural floors. Um, I would say that to some extent that might be true, but uh, it is a challenge. One could think about trying to get louvering past some of these belt walls uh, and, and getting equipment past some of these outriggers is a challenge. Um, and now I, I really kind of leading into the next, I want to kind of just give some comparisons. That's Jetta Tower uh, uh, on the right, which you'll hear more about. Uh, Burj 2020, or as we called it, or Uptown Dubai Tower 1 uh, is on the left. Uh, and these are shots of it at the base, so it gives you a sense of how massive the floor plates are. Jetta Tower was a much more slim nine uh, tall building than this one, uh, where you don't have as much body to the building. Um, and you can, it's obvious from the, these area shots here from the, of the plan. And this is the overview uh, overlaying the two uh, to give you a sense of scale. Uh, we did a substantial amount of wind tunnel testing. Um, on the project, and uh, this is just a, a shot of the aeroelastic model that we have. Um, we did early force balance tests where it's just a rigid static model in the wind tunnel, uh, all the way up to what we call the, the Cadillac models, uh, where you actually design a steel, or, or, or I should say an aluminum spine, that simulates the stiffness of the actual structure, and that's to get the aerodynamic feedback during the wind tunnel test, so you can capture what they call aerodynamic damping. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can hurt your uh, actual response or it can help your response, but you really don't know until you start doing either very sophisticated uh, numerical uh, calculations or actually physically testing uh, in the wind tunnel. Um, so, Roberto, our graph initially wasn't as nice as uh, Torakoi, that's for sure. Um, but we expected it. Uh, no one's really done uh, a tower of this height uh, that's pushed to this uh, uh, response um, at 711 meters of office occupancy. It started to have some bifurcations in the response, um, and this is all looking at it without supplemental damping uh, here. So you can see it kind of takes off uh, at the upper return periods. Um, we initially studied looking at what it would mean to put in a supplemental damper. 
um, and that was one strategy. What we started to do a little bit more is start to actually tune the aerodynamics of the structure a bit more uh, through notching, through actually tuning the actual structural um, mass distribution throughout the structure. Um, not necessarily adding more mass, but moving it around to areas that it might be more inertially beneficial, like at the top. Uh, as well as then studying uh, a little more sophisticated wind, wind tunnel modeling like the aeroelastic model. Uh, all of that got us to quite a, quite a nice response where you can actually see no more bifurcations, but you can actually start to see um, uh, a response that kind of is a little more predictable at the highest occupied floor of the structure, which is just about 700 meters. Um, so right around the office criteria, at the office floor, the highest office floor, a couple floors down, we're right on the criteria. So a lot of work when we kind of close out this design uh, is to be done yet, uh, just to kind of validate that so we have some sensitivity. Um, but overall, it was an aerodynamic and wind uh, engineering um, iterative exercise that got us to this point, um, which, you know, going back to this slide, you would think you'd never get there, you need a damper, and then this is just... Uh, putting a little more uh, analytical muscle and brain behind uh, how you lay out the structure gets you quite a bit closer to uh, where you need to be. So the last thing, you know, we didn't talk about the site, but it's a site of super talls. Um, the first phase is actually this office building here, or mixed use building here now, which is uh, the, what was called Tower 2. It's now called Uptown Tower. Um, it's 340 meters and not 711, but quite a significant structure. Um, for those of you who uh, like uh, are privy to wind engineering and uh, the concept of wake buffeting, uh, what we started to find out is we channeled all of our buildings uh, to this nice open plaza and then put uh, this big tower right down the main wind direction uh, for this second tower. We didn't have much flexibility with the site. Uh, we played with some rotations and some adjustments, but in the end we had to live with this placement uh, which um, the wake buffeting phenomenon is it, it can maybe be better seen from from this image here. So this is the 711 tower. Here is the 340 meter tower. What happens is, is as the wind comes down and hits this building, the wakes that come off from the wind just so happen to be in uh, sync uh, in sequence with the frequency of this tower. So you could assume it to be that if you had resonance on this tower, you just kept punching it. Like a, like a roundhouse punch over and over and over and over to the, to the point where you actually start amplifying this load uh, on this building inertially uh, um, by a factor of two. Um, and that's a phenomenon that occurs when you introduce a building uh, of larger scale uh, that happens to be within that sweet spot of about six to eight times the diameter of the building. So that's a phenomenon we had to deal with. Um, a lot of aerodynamic tuning uh, or I should say, uh, more like wind speed strategy uh, design um, was used in order to get these loads to be reasonable. And uh, with that, this kind of leads into where we are with some construction photos. I know someone uh, is here from uh, Unimix, uh, so this probably looks familiar. Um, I'm sure you remember that from a year ago. Um, but then we're very excited to see uh, the B6 team and, uh, and the local team really progressing the project forward. This is the 340 meter tower um, as phase one of the delivery. We, we know phase two is about five years out, uh, but uh, this first phase is the financial catalyst for the second phase. They're using a unique jump uh, hybrid, jump slip hybrid system uh, that looks maybe more like a slip system in a jump capacity. Um, this is the first time I've seen it in Dubai. It's quite, quite unique and quite, quite cool to see. Uh, this is some shots at the base. Um, for maybe about two weeks ago when I was out on site um, of the, the larger columns at the base that are getting placed. Um, but with that, uh, we'd like to pass it on to Bob. Hey, thanks, John. Um, uh, well, 15 minutes isn't nearly enough time to talk about the tower, but so what I, what I decided to do is to uh, uh, concentrate mostly on the uh, concrete technology issues uh, for this particular uh, setting. But before I do, uh, I've given uh, talks and presentations all around the world. I've probably done 50 of them in the last six or seven years on the tower. And one thing I always say, and I'll repeat it here again today, this tower would never be possible in structural steel. 
and my 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 good friends from American Institute of Steel Construction don't like that, but that's the truth. And if you ask me why that is, I can give you three good reasons. The first is the knock on uh, concrete for tall buildings, going back all the way to the late 60s and early 70s, you know, the, the time of Sears Tower and uh, old World Trade Centers, was that concrete, the, the columns just got to be too big. And that was a strength issue. Uh, that's, not, that's no longer true anymore. There have been huge advances in high strength concrete, not only in, in, the, in the strengths, but in the ability to deliver those concretes uh, at, at ever-growing heights. So that's number one. Number two, when you're designing these super tall buildings, your, your enemy is wind. And the best, and the worst part about wind, besides the motions that it induces on the towers, is overturning on the foundations at the base of the tower. The best way to resist overturning is by gravity. And concrete weighs a lot more than steel. So these towers, you need that weight of the building to end up resisting overturning, okay? The third one has to do with the motion. As you get taller and taller, the motions in these buildings get to be uh, more and more. Occupants have the tendency to start to complain. It turns out concrete, because it's the mass of concrete is a big benefit for motions. Motions will go down basically inversely with the, with the weight of the building. So these buildings are uh, easily 50 or 100% uh, more heavy than steel buildings, and that reduces the motions uh, dramatically. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, I'll try to uh, get into a little bit of the detail on, the, on what concrete we're using for the tower. This is, uh, this is what I call our rogues gallery as structural engineers of, of tall buildings, but Burj Khalifa there that Larry worked on, uh, is the current world's tallest building. Jeddah Tower will be not only the world's tallest, but be the first man-made structure to reach one kilometer in height. You see uh, a couple of a uh, couple of more venerable Thornton Thomas City buildings there: the Patronus Towers in Kuala Lumpur, Taipei 101, and Shanghai Tower, which just uh, completed within the last year and a half or so. Uh, a little bit of little bit of facts, as, as mentioned in several. Uh, presentations already. Uh, all the design is to ACI 318. That's wonderful for U.S. structural engineers. It's one less, there's a lot to worry about on these towers and not having to, to learn a new code is great. ACI 318, if those of you don't know, it's the gold standard around the world. Uh, it, uh, it, is, it is used throughout and, uh, and particularly for tall buildings. Uh, the uh, architect for the project is Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill, two uh, architects that I worked with for 23 years at SOM. Uh, the, the owner is the Jetta Economic Company. A, uh, we, we won the competition in, in the summer of 2009, so it's been 10 years that I've been working on the project. Uh, the Saudi Bin Laden Group is the general contractor, and we have a very good partner, local partner, Darrell Hendesa, who... Uh, who is uh, monitoring all the construction on site. Now, this is a very important slide. As structural engineers, what we really seek for in these tall buildings is simplicity. Because the simpler it is, the easier it is to build. And the structure that we came up with for Jetta Towers is probably the thing I'm most proud of, and it's simplicity itself. If you look at that diagram, there's no columns. It's all walls, okay? And all of those walls are interconnected. There's no inside core and outside columns. There's no outriggers. Uh, there's no spandrel beams. All of the floors are flat plate construction. Uh, and uh, there's no column, no column or wall transfers. As, they, as the building uh, ascends, the walls simply drop off as those cross walls that you see there get closer and closer to the, the edge of the three legs, they simply drop off. All the walls are vertical with the, the exception of the dark blue walls. Those walls uh, encapsulate the fire stairs. And this is a very safe building in terms of the, the fire life safety because the fire stairs are at the end of the three wings. So that was one of the problems with the World Trade Centers is that the fire stairs were quite close to each other. These are as far apart as they can possibly be. 
And that's the only part of the structure that slopes, and it slopes at a constant uh, slope from the top of the foundation to the top of the building, each of those three wings. So it's very, very simple geometrically, very simple construction. We worked on it very, uh, very carefully with Saudi bin Laden Group to make it as buildable as possible. Now, in terms of the, the materials uh, that we're using, uh, believe it or not, the concrete, the maximum concrete strength that we've specified is only 85 megapascal, I, uh, which is t about 12,000 psi concrete for those here in the United States. So it's not nothing exotic. So yes, it's high high strength concrete, no doubt about it. I would have liked to have used 100 megapascal, and the reason I would have liked that is I think we could have reduced. I know we could have reduced the amount of reinforcing in the walls particularly at the base of the tower. It gets uh, fairly, fairly congested at the, at the base, and 100 would have been uh, more than welcome. All the concrete is uh, self-consolidating concrete. The rebar strength is 60 KSI, a little bit of 75 KSI rebar uh, at the base of the tower. All of the lap splices uh, for the wall reinforcing, the vertical bars in the wall, are all done with mechanical couplers. So it's, it's built to be quickly uh, and have no problems in terms of the concreting. Very simple wall, wall forms and wall construction. This is the mix design for the basic 85 megapascal concrete. So it's got, uh, it's got microsilica and, and fly ash, but uh, slag is not readily available in the kingdom. So it's basically a, a tri-mix, uh, 10 millimeter, 3 eighths inch aggregate in general. Uh, you can see that um, one thing that as engineers gets overlooked every once in a while in these tall buildings, these high strength concretes weigh more than your standard si uh, sidewalk concrete. So when you, if you think about it, you're, for the engineers out there, you have this in your textbook, you always use 145 pounds per cubic foot or 150 maybe. Uh, the concrete itself weighs 156, sometimes 160 pounds per cubic foot. And then if you add the rebar that's in there, it's, it probably works out to an average of even higher than that. So if you, if you miss that for a building like Jetta Tower, when a lot of the load that's being resisted is the, the weight of the tower itself, you could be off by quite a bit. So it's, uh, so, uh, in terms of, uh, the concrete materials, we've been doing a lot of testing, as you might imagine. We specified both, uh, concrete strength, and modulus elasticity for strength, we, we specified at, at uh, 91 days. Uh, and modulus elasticity, we specified precisely what's in ACI 3, 318, uh, 57,000 square root F prime C. So it worked out to 43 plus or minus uh, giga, gigapascals for modulus. This is, uh, this is the development all the way up to uh, 180 days and beyond for the, for the strength. Uh, as it turns out, Saudi bin Laden group is very conservative, probably not surprising. Uh, the 85 megapascal concrete has been routinely testing at 110 megapascals at, at 91 days. And, and uh, so it's way, way above 85. Unfortunately, we couldn't use it in the design, like I mentioned before, because it was just too late uh, by the time we got the results. Now, here's, if you look at this, look at the shape of the curve for strength gain. And then you look at modulus. It plateaus very quickly. So if those of you doing modulus testing and you're a little bit short after 28 or 56 days, you're probably, you're probably in trouble uh, because there's not a whole lot of uh, gain in modulus once you get past, uh, you know, uh, three, four, five months. But we are hitting, on average, about 42 gigapascals. So within, within, uh, you know, our design calculations for the, for the modulus elasticity. Modulus is kind of a new thing. And, uh, we, we, we used it on Trump Tower in Chicago. It's probably one of the first, first, uh, towers we do it. ACI 318 actually needs to be, uh, fortified a bit in terms of how we specify modulus elasticity for tall buildings. It doesn't make any sense to be designing these tall buildings and not do modulus testing. It's like, the, the, stri the stiffness of the building is just as important as strength, and it's time for ACI 318 to do the same uh, due diligence for the specification for modulus on these buildings as for strength. Now, we've been getting a lot of material uh, uh, test results uh, back uh, from the site, 
and from the, the creep and shrinkage testing that's being done at CTL laboratories outside of uh, Chicago. Uh, all these constituent materials were shipped to, to uh, Chicago from, from Jeddah, and the testing is all done there. There's no, there's no lab uh, in the Middle East that really can test this high a strength concrete with the kind of precision that we want, so we trusted CTL. And so what we do is we're constantly, uh, every three months to six months, we recalibrate our vertical shortening models uh, based on the data that we're getting from CTL lab and the construction schedule and the uh, testing data for strength and modulus that we get on site. It's a very complicated thing. Uh, and for, for us on the tower, when we issued the design for construction, we actually gave all of the predictions for the movements of the tower, long-term uh, ver vertical shortening and horizontal movements of the tower on the drawings, and we told, they told the contractor exactly what testing needed to be done and what compensations needed to be done. They're fairly minor, but uh, the building is a little bit asymmetric, so it does move a little bit horizontally under its own weight. So it's all on the drawings. That's a Thornton Tomasetti issued for construction drawing. We use the MIDAS program. This, again, is another reason why, uh, as engineers, uh, we've made huge strides in how we predict uh, vertical shortening effects for, for creep and shrinkage on these tall concrete buildings. It used to be when I started, and shortly thereafter, I would use a, a spreadsheet, uh, probably written by Larry Novak or someone like him, uh, that we, we would take an idealized column on the perimeter and, and idealize the core wall as a column, and we'd do calculations by spreadsheet, and it was, it was torture. It, it took a long time, and you couldn't really visualize what was going on. You just had basically numbers that you were looking at. Now, you can literally build analytically the entire tower in construction sequence. And that's really only been a development for in the last 10 to 15 years. So using programs like MIDAS or now some of the CSI projects, you can build a tower and not just look at the movements of the tower, the shortening of the columns and the walls and so forth, but you can actually look at the forces in various members. In fact, you can trace the forces in any particular element in the tower over time. It's a prediction, of course. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not the actual building out there, but that's a very powerful thing to do. And you can look at uh, deformations at any point and forces. So you can look at, for example, the, the end wall, the blue wall that I showed before. You can say, does that, does that piece of wall, does it get more load or less load over time? So, and then, then, then there's horizontal movements that we can look at as well. Just a few uh, construction photos to, to, to finish up here. 270 board piles. Uh, they, they reach up to uh, 105 meters in depth. So they're much longer than, than Roberto's piles. Uh, this, is, this is the preparation of the RAF Foundation. We have cathodic protection because the, uh, that's the Cadillac system for uh, long-term uh, corrosion protection on the piles and the RAF Foundation. We did a, a test cube for the RAF uh, Foundation that's still on site. It's like a, it's like a monolith from a, from, a, from a movie or something. This is, this is just the bottom bars in the five meter thick raft. So the guy's literally up to his knees in rebar. And, uh, you basically see how the, the, the pile rebar has to come up. This is formwork for a five meter thick piece of raft foundation. The raft was poured in, in, in four sections, but that's, that's five meters thick there. Then, uh, placing booms. Yet another thing that the concrete industry has made huge advances in placement of concrete. You can put the, put the concrete exactly where it needs to go. So you can see one, one quarter of the wrap being poured from various locations. A wonderful technology. Uh, basically, we try to keep the heat into these wrap foundations, so we put uh, rigid insulation on the outside of all the pores uh, to, to keep the differential uh, down. So they all kind of, you know, you don't want them to uh, get cool too soon. So you see three of the four pores. The fourth one is in the center of the tower. This was a wonderful part of the project. You begin to see the first walls uh, starting up, and it was uh, fantastic to see the pictures come in from from Saudi Arabia for the first walls. You, piece of the piece of the end wall that I mentioned before. Uh, in terms of basically, in terms of the construction, this is a very interesting slide because there's no slabs. The uh, SBG would, we have weekly conference calls and they'd say, Bob, 
do I need to put, put some slabs in? I said, well, sooner, sooner or later you do, but, uh, but you can see that the system is very stable. We need slabs, obviously, uh, as floor diaphragms later on, but, but uh, they can go quite, quite a ways without putting the floor slabs in. This is the jump form, form work. You see some of the, st the structures that are outside the, the thing as well. So this is, a, this is the current status. We're at uh, about uh, 265 meters in height, so about a quarter. Uh, exterior wall you begin to see has been started down, the, down at the base. Uh, we the, this first wall setback is uh, already reached. Uh, even though it's only 265 out of 1,000 plus meters, 40% of the concrete has been placed. And because if you think of it, the piles and the raft foundation and the thick walls and the building tapers, uh, we're actually over 40% of the concrete is already in place. Uh, in terms of schedule, it looks like uh, the Crown Prince uh, of Saudi Arabia is now 100% behind the project, even though it's a, it's a privately funded uh, project. It's been a little bit on hold for the last 15 months, but uh, we've been on the phone quite a lot, in, John and I, in the last uh, uh, month or so. We, uh, we expect uh, uh, construction to recommence uh, uh, basically January 1st. As you know, there's been quite a bit of upheaval there and uh, many episodes that have happened in the last 18 months. So thank you very much. That's all I have.